Historical Jesus, Part 13, the Olivet Discourse. Tonight we're going to look at the statement Jesus made, the statements he made in this uh, time after he predicted the destruction of the temple. And so we begin in Matthew 24 with this prophecy of Jesus where he says, it says, Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, you see all these, do you not? Truly, I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. So everything that comes after this is because Jesus said this. Now, the temple was a huge structure. It was not at all a small structure. It was roughly the size, uh, one person estimates, of six football fields, this uh, courtyard area. And it had these different sections of it. The, the big section there in the middle is the courtyard of the Gentiles where anybody could go. And you could see that there would be some roof colonnades where you could conduct business or sell sheep for Passover, that sort of thing, out of the way of the sun. And then as you get closer, you get to the inner courtyard of the um, women and then of the Jewish men. And then finally, the actual structure of the temple itself was not that big, but it was decadent, you know, marble, gold. They say that you couldn't even look at the temple in the, the brightness of the day because it would just blind your eyes. It was just the sun gleaming off the pure gold on top of the temple and the, the marble. It was just gorgeous. And the, the stones with which they made this, this temple and its surrounding platform were massive, you know, tons and tons each. Yeah, they, I think they, saw, they had one that was 40 tons that they found, one of the stones. Uh, even, even modern equipment would really struggle. Uh, to move, and the, the, when they made the temple, they put the stones together so well, without mortar, that you couldn't even put a piece of paper between them. Uh, that's how finely done they were. Uh, so, this is what Jesus is saying is going to be destroyed and not one stone left upon another. I mean, that's a flamboyant statement. I mean, it's, not, it's like saying the White House is going to be destroyed. I mean, it would really rock their world. It would really get their attention, even more than that, because it's not just a, a national symbol. It's a religious symbol. It symbolizes the presence of God. And not only that, it's the worship center. It's how you worship God. You're not allowed to offer sacrifices other places. So Jesus saying the temple is going to be destroyed really got his disciples' attention and caused them to ask some questions. And what they asked him was, uh, they came to him privately. We know from, I'm, I'm reading from Matthew 24 primarily, but we know from Mark that this was four of his disciples, Peter, James, Andrew, and John. And they came to him and, and asked him privately saying, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So that's the question that they have. It's kind of a multiple part question, right? Like when will these things be? Uh, when it says these things, we're talking about the destruction of the temple. That's what Jesus had just said. The temple is going to be destroyed. And then they, they also asked, what is the sign of your coming? Right, And they also have that going along with the end of the age. So in the disciples' mind, Jesus says, hey, this temple is going to be destroyed. They're just like, all right, so when, when's that going to happen? When is the sign of your coming? And when's the sign of the end of the age? All is one sentence. And this is probably why I struggled so much wrestling <laughs> with uh, Matthew 24, because of how everything is lumped in together. Uh, so there are different theories about this. And... A lot of people who study this say that what ended up happening was this got fulfilled 40 years after Christ. In the year A.D. 70, uh, the temple, the Romans destroyed the temple. They burned it with fire and they, they knocked the stones apart from each other and really decimated it. And, uh, you know, so a lot of scholars are going to look at that and they're going to say, well, that's the fulfillment of Jesus. Jesus is predicting what happened in the year 70. And then others are, they say, well, close but not quite. What Jesus is actually talking about is a future temple yet to be built. And when that temple is built, then these uh, prophecies will be fulfilled. 
Um, and then a third option could be that somehow Jesus is encompassing both of these scenarios in what he's saying. Uh, and so in your notes, I've included different um, statements by people explaining what things meant if you go with one or other of those positions. And I'm going to leave it to you to some degree to figure that out on your own. Um, but I'll, I'll offer some, some comments as we go forward. I don't want to lose, I don't want to miss out the main significant points Jesus made in my effort to figure out the timing of everything. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I don't want to, I don't want to miss the uh, trees for the forest or the forest for the trees. Yeah, the forest for the trees. Anyhow, verse 4, Jesus answered them, so this is Jesus' answer to the question, hey, when is this all going to happen? See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of birth pangs. And so what we have here is everything that's not a sign. They had asked him, let me go back here. They had asked him, what will be the sign of your coming? Right? They're asking for a sign. How do we know when you're coming? He says, well, you know, there are, there are going to be people that are going to say, I'm the Christ. Don't listen to those people. And there are going to be earthquakes. That's not the end. There's going to be wars and rumors of wars. And in another one of the Gospels, he adds in pestilence, right? And he says, look, these things are going to happen. This is like the beginning of the contractions. This is not the deliverance of the baby. This is the beginning of the tr contractions. It's two different things. They're linked together. One comes before the other, right? But these are not, these are non-signs is what I call them. And then we get into verse 9 where he talks about persecution. And see, what's Jesus' concern about the, the, this, this information? It's that his disciples would not fall away because of what happens, whether what happens leading up to it or what happens during it. And so he says to them, verse 9, they will then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. There's a lot of many's there, isn't there? Did you notice that? It says many will fall away. There will be many false prophets to lead many astray. And the love of many will grow cold. It seems like everybody's going crazy, right? Um, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. And so what Jesus is saying is, look, before any of this stuff happens, before the end of the world, what is going to happen is they're going to persecute you, my followers. And when that happens, you just need to endure. That's what he says. You need to, you need to endure, whether to the end of your life, because he says many of you are going to be put to death, right? Um, and uh, he says many will fall away. Don't fall away. Don't betray one another. If times get tough, if you get persecuted, persevere. That's what he's saying here. Um, and then he says, this, this is interesting too, where he says, the go this gospel of the kingdom has to be preached to all nations as a testimony, and then the end will come. So I guess that gives us motivation to go do something, huh? Um, yeah, that's the, the missionary verse right there, Matthew 24, 14. Good for the refrigerator, if you ask me. And then it gets interesting. I mean, it was interesting, but now it's like, it gets kind of like sci-fi interesting. So this is what I call the A of D. And that's just because abomination of desolation is a lot of letters. All right. But this is the true sign. Jesus has gone through the non-signs. Hey, look, if there's a war, that's not the end. If there's an earthquake, that's not the end. If they persecute you, they persecuted me. Of course they're going to persecute you, right? And then he gives the true sign. What is the true sign of the end? How does he answer their question? Their question is, what's the sign? The true sign is, so when you see the abomination, Matthew 24, 4, 15, of desolation, the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea 
flee to the mountains. So as soon as you see this event occur, that's your signpost to run. <laughs> flee to the mountains is what it says. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house, and let one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant, for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath, and then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, nor ever will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. So that's the juicy part right there, the abomination of desolation. And so according to Jesus, the abomination of desolation is what kicks off the Great Tribulation period. Uh, I want to show you this uh, statement from the book of Maccabees here because Daniel, Daniel mentions the abomination of desolation at least three times in chapter 9, chapter 11, and chapter 12, maybe even one more time than that. And it's not clear from Daniel that <clears throat> these are all things from Jesus' perspective that are already fulfilled or if there's still one yet to come. All right? And... So, a lot of people thought the abomination of desolation, at least one of the ones Daniel spoke of, had been already fulfilled before the time of Christ. And uh, this is something we read about in that period between the Old Testament and the New Testament in the book of Maccabees, uh, a good historical source. 1 Maccabees 144 says, And the king sent letters by messengers to Jerusalem and the towns of Judah, this is the Greek king, the bad guy in the story. He directed them to follow the customs strange to the land, to forbid burnt offerings and sacrifices and drink offerings in the sanctuary, to profane Sabbaths and festivals, to defile the sanctuary. So that's key right there, defile the sanctuary. And the priests, to build altars in the priest, sacred precincts and shrines for idols, and to sacrifice swine and other unclean animals. All right, so these would be, what's an abomination? It's, it's like vomit. It's something that is just detestable and disgusting. That's what an abomination is, in case you weren't sure. And desolation is, is destruction, right? So something disgusting that brings about destruction. And so what had happened over 150 years before Christ was born was this, this Greek king, Antiochus IV, installed an altar um, on top of the existing altar and sacrificed to idols and sacrificed pigs, unclean animals, to these idols. And that, uh, that was an abomination. It was disgusting. And it, and it did bring about desolation in that time. In fact, uh, later on, when they finally recaptured the temple, they were surprised at how desolate it all was. There were weeds growing up everywhere and, and things were broken down and it was just all in disarray. And they had to clean it out for eight days and, and there was this big period of uh, re rededicating the temple and that's what, what they call Hanukkah. Uh, verse 54 here, Now on the 15th day of Kislev in the 145th year, they erected a desolating sacrilege on the altar of burnt offering. So that's, that's about as close as you can get to abomination of desolation right there. A desolating sacrilege. They also built altars in the surrounding towns of Judah and offered incense at the doors of the houses and in the streets. And then 59, on the 25th day of the month, they offered sacrifice on the altar that was on top of the altar of burnt offering. And so this was a, a, a terrible thing that had happened before. But Jesus is talking about this over 160 years later. Almost 200 years later, Jesus is saying... When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, then run away. So, however much this might have been a fulfillment to, to some aspects, Jesus is still looking for something future from his point of view. Okay, um, But this gives us a way of thinking about what sorts of abominations it could be. So there are other possibilities that people have for what this abomination could be. It turns out that in the, uh, the time of the war, just before the war in the year 70, there was an incident that happened in the temple area. And this is uh, from R.T. France talking about the abomination of desolation. He writes, Josephus records that in the winter of 67-68, 
the zealots under John of Geshala took over the temple itself as their headquarters. And I'm just going to read the English here. Uh, With the feet being defiled, they entered into the sanctuary, appointing their own mock high priest to carry out a travesty of temple ritual. Popular outrage led to fighting within the temple itself with zealot blood defiling the sanctuary. It took place just before the first major campaign of the Roman Emperor Vespasian in Judea, when it was still possible to escape into the hills. And so this people look at as a possible sign that those who were alive in that time, some of whom would have been the actual disciples of Jesus, by the way, that would still be alive 30, 40 years later, right? That they would see this sign, these zealots who had taken over, making a mockery of the high priest and getting slaughtered and having their blood go in the temple. Uh, Dead bodies, um, according to the law of Moses, make the area unclean, okay? And so it would be abominable for this sort of thing to happen. And it would be early enough where they could still get out of the city because eventually what happens is the Roman soldiers come and they surround the city in ancient siege warfare and they block off all the food and basically starve everyone to death. Well, not everyone, but about a million or so people, according to Josephus, starve to death in the city while the Roman soldiers are out there. So you need to get out before that happens. And so uh, R.T. France is saying that that's what's going on here. But... Here, here's another scripture that's like pulling me in the other way. So that's pulling me towards a fulfillment in the past. And then I have 2 Thessalonians, right, where the Apostle Paul writes in uh, chapter 2, verse 1, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or worship of God so that, and this is the part I want to focus on, he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Now that would be an abomination in the temple area if, if somebody went in there and claimed that they were God, right? And then he goes on in verse 8, And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. So that when this occurs, all right, when this one goes into the temple and claims to be God, that's when Jesus comes, Jesus comes back to kill that person. All right? So there's no, there's no record, historical record of Jesus coming back visibly or invisibly to kill the person who took the temple. The person who took the temple, it turns out, is a, is a man named Titus. And Titus later went on to become the Roman emperor himself. So he did not perish in the plundering and destruction of the temple at all. And so far as we know, he also did not claim to be a god in the temple area. So uh, this, is, this is pushing me towards a future fulfillment rather than a past fulfillment. But I want to hold it in tension for you just for a little while longer, if you can uh, bear with me. All right, then we get back to what Jesus says here, right? He says, look, if you see this happen, run away. It's going to be nasty. You don't want it to be the Sabbath. The the gates of the city would be locked on the Sabbath. You wouldn't be able to get out. Um, People would notice that you're leaving on the Sabbath because you're not supposed to walk that far on the Sabbath, these sorts of things. And, um, you know, if you're pregnant, it's going to be more difficult to run away, obviously, than if you're not pregnant. Um, And the winter makes it more difficult as well. So these are all things that you don't want to have happen. Um, And that's when this great tribulation begins. Now, we move on to verse 23 here, where then he says, Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. <laughs> For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Yeah, he said that. He said that that was going to happen. And you know what? That has happened throughout history. People have risen up over and over claiming to be the Christ. They did it before the time of Jesus. They did it after the time of Jesus. And they're still doing it today. I just watched a YouTube video of a lady in Miami who claims that she is Christ and Christ is a woman. 
appropriate for International Women's Day that I mentioned that. But <laughs> there you have it. So Christ is really a woman, and um, yeah, lots of false Christs still to this day, right? And Jesus says, look, they're going to be false Christs, and don't believe them. Don't believe them. How, do we, how, do we, how can we be sure to steer clear of falling for a false Christ? Jesus tells us. He says, if they say to you, look, he's in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures gather. It's kind of gross, but it's true. It's true that if you see off in the distance, you know, we have this field across from the church here. If you see off in the distance vultures circling in the sky, that tells you there's some sort of corpse down there that they're circling around or something that's about to become a corpse. Uh, so there, that, that's a visible sign of what's happening on the ground. You can't see the, the dead animal, right? But you can see the vultures in the sky. Same thing with the lightning, right? The lightning is a visible sign. It, it, it's not anything to do with the speed of lightning. It has to do with the visibility of lightning. It shines from one side of the sky to the other also. I know it's quick, but you don't miss it when it happens, right? Because it's so bright, and of course, then you have the, the thunder that goes along with it, right? And so Jesus is saying, it's going to be obvious. When the coming of the Son of Man happens, it's going to be obvious. That's what I feel like what he's saying. He's not, I mean, it's not that complicated. He's like, look, there, don't, don't go over here to the desert. Don't go meet this guru in a cave. It's going to be obvious, all right? You're going to know. And then... He goes on to explain it a little bit more in verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun, sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Those who take a past view of this prophecy struggle here. But they have ways of dealing with it. And I included one such explanation by a renowned scholar in your notes so that you could see how they take this. Uh, this is a, a section that, to me, pulls me way towards a future fulfillment because there's no indication that Jesus already came back and sent out all the angels and the trumpet in the year 70. There's just no indication of that at all. Um, but then, in the very next section, Jesus says the following. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as this branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very doors. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. So that wants, that's yanking me back the other way, like, whoa, he said this generation, he's got to be talking to the people in front of him. Uh, they're not going to pass away until all these things. And then he, to emphasize it, make it more difficult, he says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. In other words, this is definitely, absolutely, I'm, I'm, I'm not joking, guys. This is serious, right? Uh, and so the question is, well, what does he mean with this generation. So I, I have a few different possibilities for you. I don't have, like I said, I don't have time to go through all this. Um, I, I just want to uh, show you these possibilities and see what you think about them. The first is that this generation refers to the generation of his original disciples. He's talking to them. If I say to you, this, Lance, this generation will not pass away, you're thinking your lifetime, right? That's a natural way to take it. Um, Another way to take it is that generation means a race. It's another way you can look at that word, a genea, uh, uh, for generation. And that the Jewish race will not pass away before the end. And then a third possibility is that this generation is the future generation that sees the abomination of desolation. Once these signs come, this generation that sees the abomination will not pass away until all these things come. I, I lean towards... Uh, both one and three at the same time, personally. But I know some really good people that believe in two. And uh, I'm not going to blow them up right this second, okay? Uh, so here's, here's my hypothesis on it before I want to press on to get to the parables in chapter 25. Here's my hypothesis. 
and, 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 and what I want to ask almost like as a question. Could both be right? I mean, is there a way <laughs> in which both could be right where Jesus, what he says is relevant to the people who heard him in the first century and helped them in the first century to avoid getting stuck into a horrible situation where you're starved to death by the Roman army and yet still relates and is relevant to those who are alive in that ultimate day when the Son of Man comes back and takes over and sends out the angels. And so, you know, maybe that sounds like I'm trying to have my cake, eat my cake and have it too. But I ask you this question, is God so limited that he couldn't give Jesus words capable of multiple layers of meaning? I don't think God's so limited. He made it the universe. I mean, I think he could, could possibly do that. Um, and I just want to show you this little statement here by Craig Keener that I found helpful. He says, Old Testament prophets often grouped events together by their topic rather than their chronology. And in this discourse, Jesus does the same. He addresses what are grammatically two separate questions. When is this temple going to be destroyed? When is the coming of the Son of Man? Uh, the time of the temple's destruction and the time of the end. And so... That's just some thoughts on that. You figure it out. Let me know what you figure out. The point is, don't fall for the false Christ. If persecution comes, persevere. Are we good with those two points? All right. Now, the rest of what Jesus says is, be alert. Be prepared. Don't fall asleep. Don't be like the ten bridesmaids who five of them fell asleep when the groom came and then he came and then they didn't have, they weren't prepared with enough oil and they got left out of the wedding. How bad would it be to be a bridesmaid and then to get left out of the wedding because you weren't prepared? I mean, it would just be devastating, right? And uh, then the groom's over there. He's got ten groomsmen. The bride's just got five bridesmaids. Awkward, right? So that's, that's no good. Certainly not. Um, Jesus tells a bunch of these parables of preparedness. He, he, in uh, chapter 24, verse 42, he talks about the unpredictable thief. He says, look, if you, if you knew what hour the house would get broken into, you, you would stay up, right? And so the point of that one is be ready for the unexpected arrival. After that, he talks about the faithful servant who is found so doing when the master comes as opposed to the slacker servant who's getting drunk and beating the other servants. He's like, it's not going to go well for that guy. That's a very mild way of me putting it. And then you have, like I said, the ten virgins, the bridesmaids, were, they, they're not prepared, right? And so Jesus is telling story after story to make the point, be on the alert, don't slack off, don't let your fire go out. Be prepared for an unexpected arrival. And then he tells the story about the servants and the talents. He says this one gets five talents, this one gets two talents, this one gets one talent. The one who made five, who had five, made five more. You know, and, and, and they invested it or they worked with that money. Talents are money in their culture. And then there's that la lazy one, right? And he just buried his talent in the ground. And then his master came and he gave him back the money that he, that he gave him all that time before. And the master's like, you didn't make anything? And he's like, well, I, I knew you were a harsh master, so I didn't want to lose it. And the master says, you, since you knew I was a harsh master, you should have done something with it. And then he took it away from him and gave it to the one who had more. Right? And so what, what is that telling us? It's saying work hard. And what, yeah, work hard to further the affairs of the master. That's what we're supposed to do. Whatever he's given you, you're supposed to work hard to further his affairs in this generation. Uh, and then lastly, the sheep and the goats. And this is where I want to linger for a moment because I feel like this one gets short shrift a lot of times and at the same time, it's the most critical of the different parables he tells here at the end. And so, look, if, if, if when I went through this, it seemed like a whirlwind, read Matthew 24 and 25 on your own. Slow it down. You have the notes there. You can work it through and uh, meditate on it and think about it. But I don't want to miss this point. It's a huge point because what Jesus tells is this story about sheep and the goats. And you can see from the picture they look alike. Right? The sheep and the goats, you can't necessarily tell that easily, a sheep from a goat. Like, if you know what you're doing, you can. But you have to get a little close so you can see the difference, right? And so, 
every, there's all these people and they're the sheep and the goat. And Jesus says that on the last day, here, let me just go to it so I don't uh, mess it up according from memory here. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all the nations and He will separate people one from another as shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on His right, but the goats on the left. Then the King will say to those on His right, Come, you are blessed of my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you in, or naked and clothe you? And then when he, you did, when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly, I say to, I, as you did it, let me, uh, hit this right here, to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me, right? And that's a key point there. Jesus takes it personally how we treat those in need. Does that make sense? He takes it personally. In other words, he says, you fed me. And they said, we didn't feed you, Jesus. We fed this hungry person over here. And Jesus says, when you did it to that hungry person, you did it to me. So that's what it means to take something personally. And then he, he goes on the flip side with the goats, and he says, I was hungry and you didn't feed me. And the goats, what do they say to him? When did we see you hungry, Jesus? Jesus, if we saw you hungry, we would have given you food. And he says, well, when you, when you didn't do it to one of these, you didn't do it to me. Right? This is Jesus spelling out how it's going to go on the day of judgment. Are we just going to ignore that? You know what I mean? Like, this is a big deal. And so... You know, I, I realize that deception is rampant in Christianity today. It's rampant in every group. I'm, I study a lot of church history, so I know a lot of the different groups. You know, if you're, if you're from a Catholic background, you think you're in because of the sacraments. If you're a Calvinist, you think you're predestined, and therefore you're saved. If you're a Seventh-day Adventist, you think you're in because you keep the Sabbath and you don't eat bacon. If you're a Baptist, you think you're in because you prayed the sinner's prayer one time. If you're a Pentecostal, you think you're in because you speak in tongues once when you were first saved. Or... We think we're in because we know that God's name is Yahweh or that God's one instead of three and one or we understand the kingdom. And yet, what does Jesus say? He says, feed the hungry, give the thirsty a drink, welcome the stranger, even if he's an immigrant, clothe the naked, visit the sick, the imprisoned. And when you did it to one of the least of these, you did it to me. He says that he's going to say that on the day of judgment. We cannot Ignore that. I'm not saying that other issues of truth don't matter. Of course they matter. But we cannot ignore this on the other side. Do you understand what I'm saying? The simple fact is, it, you know, and sometimes, I'll be honest with you, I feel like the idiot who buried the talent in the ground. I do. I feel like, Sean, what are you doing? You know, you, like, what, what have you done? Seriously. Right? But you know what? You can't. I mean, what, do you, what are we going to do? Just like beat ourselves up and say, oh, we're, we're, we're all going to go goat, grow goatees so that we can be like the goats? No, that didn't make sense. But, you know, we're not, we don't, we're not going to be the goats, right? You want to be the goats? No. If, 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 this, if this convicts us, let's just change that. Let's reach out. Let's do what needs to be done. And if we are already doing it, let's find other ways to do it so that on the last day when Jesus comes back, he says, well done. Good and faithful servant. He doesn't say, you were asleep and your fire went out. That's what happened to those virgins. You were asleep and you let your fire go out. Or to the person whose house got broken in, you weren't watching, so you got robbed. These are all parables Jesus tells. You know, there's a lot of convicting force behind them. Or he says, oh, you were partying with the unbelievers. That's a servant that wasn't the good and faithful servant, right? And so... We don't want to be caught unaware while this is going on. We don't want to, and he, he, the other one he tells is about the flood. He said, look, on the, in the day of Noah, when the flood came, people were getting married. People were enjoying life. They were working their jobs. It was just another Tuesday. Well, I don't know if it was a Tuesday, but, and then the flood came and destroyed them. 
So it's going to be unexpected. So the point is, live for God today. Each day, you wake up and you live for God. We, well, we do well to take this to heart. It's so easy to get caught into questions of interpretation and chronology and miss our Lord's earnest practical warnings. I think it's fine to study this stuff, obviously. But at the same time, I don't want to be so focused on what he, what he said, what he didn't say, and what the different views are that I miss out on the naked person that needs clothes next door to me. You know what I mean? So I think we need to do both. All right? So that's enough for now. Let's take a break, and we'll come back and look at the Last Supper. <laughs>